starting to commence to begin. And uh, this is the College of Complex. Uh, you are welcome tonight, and we will be hearing a lot about Korea. You see the map here. Uh, it's been a, a while since uh, Korea was so much in the news, but we do get, now I believe we will hear from our speaker. Thank you, uh, uh, fellow collegians, graduates. Yes, I've been uh, I've been attending off and on here since probably 1980 with all sorts of subjects, from architecture to ethnic neighborhoods. But lately, I've seen the uh, menu, the format, is cause travel, and we've had uh, just last week Dan Smith talk about Bolivia and Ecuador. How he gets into some of these countries is beyond me, but uh, he, uh, uh, Tim's trimming our tree tonight. Thank you, Tim. Something in his stock. He's looking at stock. All right, um, There was a talk by uh, Bill Fong on Chinese uh, development of their pictographic writing system and uh, language over two centuries, two, two millennia, yeah, two, two millennia. Um, so I, I've seen lots on travel here, um, Stansfield on Cuba, he was fortunate enough to see the inside view of Cuba, and Stansfield uh, also, he did something else dangerous there. Where did he go to? North. Korea. north. He got in and penetrated the north. Something dangerous about North Korea. And, well, I wouldn't want to be there alone on the Greyhound. I the really sure it's not going to hurt you. <laughs> Were you reading Kaplan's Press? Uh, you just can't get in alone. Likewise, Cuba, but that's pretty relaxed now. So I've, I've been on his trail, I think, in seeing Cuba last year and seeing Korea this year. And, um, you know, why go at all? Well, why bother? I mean, we're safe here and, and we don't need to get on airport lines and, and be. But why, why bother to go? At all. Why leave the country? Oh, isn't it? We're in a bubble, it's safe. Right? I think there's nothing like getting on soil and comparative studies. And you just don't get it from watching uh, Rick's speech. You just don't. You don't get the same feeling as, uh, here I am, uh, I gotta try and speak a language, I gotta, I gotta find my way on the subway, I've got to uh, sit on this bus and ask someone else where to get off the bus. Uh, nothing like it, and especially for comparative economics. Do we really have it better off here and in what ways? I don't know until I get somewhere else and talk to folks on how they make their living. Uh, comparative environment, is it cleaner? Is it really cleaner or, or more dangerous? Um, Comparative religions. How seriously do they take their religion on a daily basis? We know this is a big issue in the Muslim community now. Is it is it polemics or is it from the heart as far as religious defense? Um, and then finally schools. I like to go into public schools and see what's happening and think about our own. Ming a high school history teacher I thought, well, how do they do it? What do they study? Do they study um, civil rights in this country, or do they study some sort of obedient uh, dogma? And what are they doing in the math classes and such? So I try to get into a school and walk the hall. Uh, and, and so I take you to Korea tonight. Thank you, Ron. With a... So we're going to do 
<coughs> with a focus on six areas of it. Uh, culture and a class system. I guess starting from 2,000 years ago, looking at culture and class. And the idea is that America threw that off to 300 years ago. We got rid of a class-based system. Well, how about in China? How, how about in Latin America? How are the class systems preserved? Uh, how do they perpetuate themselves? Or are they disappearing? I look at foods. To know a culture is to share a table and eat, eat and try the foods. Um, I mentioned the schools. Try to get in one, see what's going on. I'm going to talk about retail, retailing services. Services, some pretty outstanding examples. Beat it, no, beat it Boy Scout. Um, <laughs> retailing, and Marshall Fields didn't just invent that, not even at Selfridge. Uh, did did Mr. Uh, Selfridge extend that? But now, now we see Asian retail models. I'm going to look at safety, the safety factor. Are you safer here on a bus, or is your food safer than it is in some other countries that are against this genetically modified foods? And and how are you? How are you in the end in Korea uh, on that topic of safety, public safety? And then, what everyone wants to talk about, I think, the hot war, cold war issue, as Brown very, very clearly put about uh, the hot, or the amber light last summer was, what's Kim, baby Kim, I call him, what's baby Kim son going to do uh, now that he's in control? Um, and, and will there be a hot war starting up on the DMZ line? And can we even worry about it since we're tied down in the Middle East? And who's going to help us? And will Japan step in and will that cause more resentment? And, and then a uh, uh, wild card is what is China going to do? Uh, having their neighbor of North Korea uh, hemmed in, which means they could be next in a domino situation. I won't go too deeply into the whys and wheres, and you'll probably ask about that. But those are the six, five or six things. Um, class and culture, foods, retailing, school, uh, the safety factor, quality of life and safety, and the cold war versus a hot one, or I call it cold war versus hot peace. Uh, here it is, and you've seen it in the news since 1949, and you know about the division and the hot war for about three years, dividing this very mysterious hinterland we don't know very much about, uh, especially the public and the tourists, just doesn't get in. But we hear stories from people who manage to get out. And then, of course, this economic miracle we talk about, growing faster than Japan did, South Korea, or the Rock, Republic of Korea. Um, in 40 years, in 50 years, well, I could carry it. How's the voice carry back there? Not too good, not too not, good. Oh, then I got it. All right. Hey, something Motorola probably developed. So I'm not going to say uh, this was from Samsung, but this walking, walking mic here is a sure product. Hey, I'm I like to talk about products that are dominant now and products that are losing ground. Motorola lost some ground in the last 10 years. They've got to research. But I was fortunate enough to see the countryside and cities, Seoul being number one, uh, about 3 million people, same as Chicago in the metro area, Busan being number, number two, a major port of about a million people, Busan. And I think you know the story on how the idea is China made the first move in penetrating, this reminds me so much of North Korea and South, the South Vietnam, North Vietnam conflict. We haven't learned much uh, since, since that in 30 years, but I think that China started a similar pattern in penetrating villages and towns, taking over elections or 
persuading local elections until the South Korea government and America having just fought a war, uh, a major world war, MacArthur, Truman struggling on what to do. And in 1949 to 1953, um, the major defeat was pushing Chinese and North Korean sympathizers uh, into village by village uh, dominance of the South Korean peninsula until pretty much pushed to Busan, um, there was a rollback. Uh, finally, a rollback in the entrance of the United Nations. Well, that's old history. We know all that from the news and Walter Cronkite and things that happened back then. She maybe Edward R. Murrow in those times. But um, it was quite a surprise, this Chinese incursion and this oh, conversion of the uh, post-World War II community or political community into a future yeah. communist society and the rollback that eventually followed down to a stalemate. Let's take a look though, because I think I digress, and Tim's going to guide me through culture and class. Could you advance one? Keep the map in your head as we talk about these places. Tim's going to advance. <laughs> You know, going back to the Silk Road, kind of a Western incursion to begin with, from Venice, uh, dry water or dry land crossing, to uh, cross the uh, the Urals and across a barren sort of a Western China situation, to uh, down into China and Southeast Asia with some uh, communication with Japan and, and some with China. But the main objective was a, a land crossing uh, sort of trade situation. And here we see some sea crossings that were made from as far away as Portugal to Goa and across India, and we won't get into the British story about that. Mm -hmm. But a little bit about Silk Road. We hear about Yo Yo Ma now bringing back Silk Road culture, and there's a lot of talk in the last couple of years about Silk Road, rediscovering yes. Silk Road. Yes. Tim, can you? I'm going to interrupt your meal with this advance, but uh, I don't. So I was able to see some incredible archi what I call indigenous architecture, and this kind of thatching was so ter terrific that. <laughs> Uh, it kept out rain, can you believe? So tight, it kept out rain, yet so porous that a summer breeze could cool your home. It's a tremendous, tremendous idea. You know, we're still building log homes 300 years ago in North America. A uh, 1,000 years ago, we had this. With mortar and... Um, uh, <coughs> basalt and volcanic rock, whatever could be hewn out of the Korean, basically, volcanic rock that grew from the sea. It was a rough style of building, and yet farmers could do it and live this way. Can we see another tip? <coughs> and this is just four or five shots on the oldest history I could find. Of course, he's in the uh, He's in a kind of a costume from a hundred uh, thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. But if you were a peasant on the land, it's probably what you'd wear. You'd have to sun, sun yourself as you're working rice fields. <coughs> and um, the balloon, balloon pants or pantaloon, that sort of thing. Can we have another? We have, uh, what would the women wear? Well, women on a holiday would wear the humble. The humble is uh, very tightly uh, tied at the bosom and then fans out. It is not a kimono, so don't, don't make that mistake, but in Korea it's a humbok. And it's used for New Year, it's used for personal family celebrations, parading on a, on a day off, and traditional women's costume. Um, next, we might have um, couple I found in the store windows, and they're about three, four hundred dollars. It's silk, 
but not as elaborate as a kimono that would cost you up to $1,000 in Japan and much more hand embroidered. Um, so I found those in a store window. You still wear those for graduations, weddings. Um, Tim, what else do we have? Uh, this fellow uh, was a laborer, and I'm interested in labor history. Always look for the underside of where I'm going, not the Marriott so much, but <laughs> what are the guys at the docks doing? What are the guys at the loading, freight loading docks doing? Well, this, this guy had rigged a chair to the back of himself. That's a pretty smart idea because it keeps his back straight while he's carrying a heavy load. Now, you or I might just lift the sack, you know, and then try to carry it on our shoulders. This guy had it figured out, so ergonomically, he could carry big loads. Working class guy. Let's see what else we have. So I took a look at some, um, I'm an architecture guy, too, labor history and architecture, and we're in the city, city of architects. And, yeah, I've never seen anything this old. Uh, not even downstate Illinois, maybe some of New England. So, this is a peasant's wall, and you'd build your home behind this sort of thing. You're trying to keep water from penetrating the top, so you're putting that tight straw on it. And then you'd think we'd, think we'd put rock in there and try to keep out the elements. Now, that's the farmer's wall, or where his home is behind that. Uh, Tim, another? I was able to look at the rich man's wall, or the rich man's home, and he's got tile protecting things, not straw. And he's got a much more regular pattern, because he probably had the poor guy build it for him, <laughs> the guy before. Rich guy. Piece that in. Um, some soil that doesn't hold that well as we would with mortar, with mortar, but this mud sort of holds things together over time. And I really admired the, the pattern and who the hell lifts those stone and puts that in place. And the third wall I was able to find is government, <laughs> government building. Straight, uh, solid. Uh, this is sort of, what's that the mortar that pops out? Somebody called, somebody told me it was called. East Europe style mortar. What is it? it what is it? Cement. Well, the mortar itself, though, sometimes pops beyond beyond the brick. We see it in Chicago buildings, and you can bring that mortar out, or you can trowel it in. Like asphalt? No. Uh, what? Asphalt? No. no, no. I think it's a European style uh, 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 of bringing your mortar out so that. It takes longer to wear it down, so the next tuck point. But this was very solid and probably built by a crew, a work crew, under the direction of the government. I thought three symbols of three classes from olden times, from a thousand years, and that was the style. Now most of this is gone, and now we've got glass and steel. Not as much brick as we use in Europe or North America, so we'd have more of this sort of um, block or basalt or whatever we can find and try to mortar it in. Anyway, go ahead, Tim. That's. Uh, okay, not a paradise in all cases. I saw some things we couldn't get away with here. Um, there's a sign, Japanese only, at this private. Not, not a private club. I'll say it's not a private club because there's a cost to go in the door. And I thought, just try that here. Say what you want about civil rights here or about Ferguson here. You can't have Polish only on a public club or you can't say only Irish on a public club in, in the United States. But here's here's a nightclub and, 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 they, and they're asking for fees at the door, but they're saying Japanese only, and they didn't even spell it right. So uh, that was about 50 bucks to go in and 
whatever they were doing in there. I could never get past the doors. I, I don't know, playing cards, dancing, whatever was going on there. But they had all the, uh, the beats on the credit cards you could get in yeah. there, if you were Japanese only. So the, their idea of a private club isn't quite what we define as a private club. If you hang, if you hang a sign, you've got to take in everyone in, in, in our sense of civil rights. Go ahead. Oh, maybe some geishas over there because some Japanese sort of company, be. yeah, in your own language for that businessman to speak. Well, I was dazzled by a little island off the coast, and it was called Jeju Island. And the story goes, the Jeju Islanders, a thousand years ago. Men had to go to the mainland to get a trade, a job, work, uh, heavy work. And that left women at home to take care of the children, make sure they go to school, unless they're babies, so I'll bring that up. But they took to diving. What can we do at home to make money to support the family? So the Jeju, Jeju women took to diving for abalone. And they didn't have tanks and wetsuits. Just now they're getting the wetsuits. They sort of sash their, sash themselves in, hide themselves, uh, wore, uh, if they could afford, a uh, some sort of leather headpiece or protective headpiece, and dove for conch, abalone, shells. If they were fortunate enough, some sort of pearl or clam, oyster. And they could go to depths of five feet, holding their breath. Five feet. I'm talking about a thousand years ago. To go, go down in a pool sometime, five feet, and try working on stone. Oh. Pretty, pretty exasperating. And they got the bends, and they got well off and drowned because they're holding their breath to get that last shell, and it may be the last one. Uh, the hell or great. Um, they could hold their breath for two minutes, and if you think that's uh, two to four minutes, if you think that's easy, try that while you're drinking your uh, coffee. And and they kind of suddenly flip up, throw their stuff. Next next slide. Throw their uh, booty, what they found, their 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 treasures, into uh, throw their treasures into a net. So you'd come up for air, <laughs> and you'd throw your oyster, pearl, abalone, whatever you could find, and scavenge, and and the ball held up your neck. You can't carry all this stuff, and you don't have much of a weight belt. You're just pulling yourself down as far as you can to the bed, and digging for things. I mean, you got a knife or a tool, and you crack it, or if you think there's something inside, you bring it up. Well, I was dazzled by the story. The women still tell the stories. And there's probably 30 or 40 who still die. They teach the younger women, if they want to, if the younger women want to, to die. And they do have wetsuits now, because in the winter it gets pretty chilly. They stop around November. These are the women of Jeju, and they remind me of that story of what the Amazon women in history and uh, another slide of the baby, Tim. The baby. Uh, you still got the, the infant, right? The six-year-old, he went to school, but you still got, what do you do with the baby? So they came up with this foot rocker. So while you're doing netting, you're, you're tapping the baby uh, uh, rocker, the, the, the crib, with your foot. While you're while you're doing netting, and if you dive, if you're going out to the to, to have a flat raft, if you're going out on the rafts, you're gonna have to leave the baby on the beach. So you want to come up now and then and see how the baby's doing on the beach, or if you're really tough, you you ask a sister. A sister means a sisterhood to, would you hold the baby while I die? And she's on the raft holding the baby, and you go down, and then you trade, and she goes down. 
Um, they had this whole folk system built together uh, to make a living while the husbands were, I don't mean off for the night, but off for a month on the mainland, making money to bring home. So it was a rough existence. It parallels some of our indigenous American, Native Americans, and some of the things they did. Uh, but these were tough women. These were the women of Jeju, and the grandmas, after their 70, couldn't dive anymore, would still get on the raft and show the women how to do the circular breathing, and how to grab the, the sea, sea creature before, uh, before you, you're out of the air. Mm -hmm. And some of them did die at an early age. And that ball, by the way, <coughs> said, hey, I'm out here. Don't forget me. I'm diving. That orange ball let you know a sister was out on the water. And if she doesn't come up, you're going to have to go down and look for her body and bring in her uh, net or try to revive her. Fascinating to me. I don't hear much about the women of Jeju. And by the way, go ahead. They have a different dialect. Too. Their Korean is a little different. Let's look at foods. Some of the things, very rich food culture where we might have chicken and various kinds of beef and pork. They have quite an array of seafood, like Susie cooks back there for Chris. <laughs> I like the seafood here. They got trout tonight. And, and there it is, sitting cold on the tail. Sorry, oh, Peter. Maybe hold it back because I'll yeah. never get to it. All right. uh, they and uh, they've got all sorts of skate, abalone, um, of course tuna, dried fish. Uh, very good at uh, marketing and preparing fresh. You don't want two-day-old fish. You want today's fish. And shoppers are good at looking back in front. I'll take that. Give me five. Five kilos of this. And so on. Well, let's move on. More about fish culture. And 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 here, um, here's here's tonight's dinner. I mean, you're you're going home. It's about twelve bucks, but you've got some nice. Um, I think that was salmon. I'm not sure, but you get it eyes and all. So here's looking at you, kid. He's looking at you there. Okay, let's see what else we've got in the way of foods. Well, talk about marketing. Here's something that uh, Target hasn't thought of yet, I suppose, or General Foods, or uh, even Miller Brewery. Um, noodles. And noodles have been around so long, another thousand-year-old tradition, hot noodles. That finally, uh, maker Nishin, you see, you see many of them now penetrating Dominic's. Oh, Dominic's rest in peace. You go to Mario's, and you see noodles, lots and lots on the shelf, and especially in Asia, hot noodles are a staple. Not Campbell soup like we would have, or alphabet soup, but noodle made from a real semolina. Uh, uh, a pasta sort of base. So here it is, and this company's decided we've been around for four or five hundred years. Let's start a museum. See if anyone will come. Let's see if see if anyone will come. Uh, well, they preserved the uh, original original test kitchen, and this is um, after World War II. <coughs> People were hungry for new food ideas and sick of boiling water and waiting for soup. So uh, one, one uh, engineer, chemist, uh, he decides, how can I flash dry, flash fry the noodle and defer the time of cooking so when I'm, when I'm home I can revive the noodle, throw in the vegetables and eat. So he worked on this and worked on this. He'd, 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 he'd uh, roll the, the noodle, then he'd shred the noodle, then he'd, he'd put it in a, a pot. And how long does it take for softening the noodle? Can I flash fry it now? 
and put it in a can or a bank or a box. And I kept working on this and working on this. Tim, what are we getting at? Huh? Oh, and we get it. What do we get now? We get 1958, the ramen noodle. Yeah. Huh. So, this is the Firestone, right? This is the, this is the Firestone of the good year of the food industry. Because uh, Rollover Campbell and Procter and Gamble, you've got some competition. Now, now, 1958, chicken and ramen, and they even spelled it C H I K I N. They're trying to be hip, and they're trying to be an international market or this sort of thing, but it pretty much stayed in Asia. The freeze dried or flash dried, flash fried noodle laden with lots of spicing, spices. I suppose, did they do that in India? Do you know? Do, are they, have they done that in India? <coughs> sure. Ready to cook, ready to make as soon as you get home. Yeah. Um, big deal, big thing. And then you could put green spices of some kind, uh, soba noodle, they call it. And here's a curry. There's a curry. Uh, flash fried, ready to drop in the scalding water. So he hit it. It took him about post-war, 1947 to 58, to get something the homemaker was willing to take a try at. I thought it was amazing that we could have a whole museum to the common noodle. Oh my god. I suppose we have a corn museum somewhere. Chicken museum, Purdue's chicken museum. Uh, Sarah Lee uh, Coffee Cake Museum. A whiskey museum. A whiskey museum, Kentucky. Yeah, let's get back to the noodle. So, now it's the 70s. Hey, now it's the 70s, and you can put coins in this machine right on the street. The water, of course, is heated by electric. Now you're on the road for lunch, yeah. building the new Asian society. You got four minutes for lunch. You got to get back to your your desk, your machine. So you got your uh, for a hundred uh, won or a few yen. You got your hot cup of noodle. Well, maybe maybe 1980. All right. Uh, what else do we have on these noodle noodle nabobs here? Wow, more on history of the lowly noodle. I, could, I couldn't believe it. And I paid money to get in there. <laughs> All right. I'm told this is the favorite dorm food of college kids now. Because it's midnight, you can't get into 7-Eleven probably. You can't uh, cook a whole meal in your, in your microwave oven. So you, you put a little boiled water on this. And you got a quick meal while you're pulling an all-nighter in the dorms. I like it. I so like it's it. come. You like it. My favorite. It's come. It's come oh. to America. So so when a product can go from this in 1958 to being a jewel, you got a hit. Just like we tried to do with Campbell or Nor or chicken or the um, ragu spaghetti sauce. Someone. Other countries are trying too to show us new tastes and show us quick ways to make food that has some quality. Well, let's leave. I think we can almost leave this, but I was fascinated uh, by this. Oh, no, we're going back. Back to the future. Come on. Back to the future. There we are. Well, they predict, this is how bold they were, space food of the future. I suppose Anders and Lovell and some of those astronauts had apple pie in a, in a squeeze bag. Well, the Chinese astronauts and, and India's trying to put up a space, space travel shuttle. Well, you squeeze the damn thing and the noodles come out and you eat this thing. This is your space ration. So my god, they're taking over space now with this noodle. I'm worried. Noodles, soup, and curry. Just add a hundred milliliters of hot water. Wow, they've really, the future's here.
They're really using their noodle. They are. Good. Thank you, David. Oh, oh, oh. They're really put some starch in it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jeez, that was good. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we could. Didn't we have a space food that. Uh, space food space. sticks? Tang. Tang. Yeah. Tang. Tang was our contribution. Oh, what? What? I don't know that. Oh, yeah. Tang while well, they were up there. That's all old right. stuff. Now we <laughs> have 3D bank to treat your fucking sandwich. Yeah. Oh. Made out of but soil and green, but it looks like oh, a sandwich. Oh, well, that's. Yeah. In space. Soil and green. Yeah, that's coming. You know. It's here and gone. What's our next. Yeah, that was called uh, soil and green. What's that called? Some sort of uh, thing you press the foil and just keep eating. Taffy? Turkish taffy? Some... Give us another, Kim. What do we have? At the... Pizza oh. noodles. Yeah, this is, well, there, this is what you buy on the street now. So as we might buy a burger or a hot dog or pizza, which is not a hot at all, for a buck and a half or the equivalent of two dollars, you'd get a pretty fresh cup of ramen still on your way to work or at lunch break and you take that thing with you uh, what has america given and i thought what 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 has america done for uh, asian tastes well one of the terrific contributions after the war there were a lot of hungry koreans were um, Rations that the GIs would say, here, have your mama cook this, or here's a candy bar, here's a Mars bar from Chicago, a uh, Tootsie Roll from Chicago. Well, this was something none of us will ever forget. Yeah! Our yeah. contribution, yeah. right? Yeah. In Russia. In Russia, popular. They like bacon, egg, sausage, and spam. We, we, the GIs, you know, they, they did some damage, but they also tried to, here, kid, have a candy bar. They left so much of this, and if you hadn't a good meal and you were in a war-torn country, you learned to slice this off, and and you fry this up, and my God, it was like skirt steak. It was heaven. Sixty years later, this stuff was still on the supermarket shelf. I thought, oh my goodness. Sixty years old. So this was like... Uh, uh, my gauge flying. Kennedy rations, uh, you know, what he would say. And in Russia too? Until you know, when? Oh, yeah, it's very popular and, and people appreciate it because it, they was very hungry and America was helping them with okay. this kind of, some soldier head, it was big delicatessen, you know. Uh, drop in, airlift, this sort of thing. But, I mean, They've got all this rich seafood today, and they're still saying, good old Spam, I still need a little Spam with lunch. My grandpa had this, and I still spam like... Spam is ham that flunked it. It worked. Mm -hmm. Spam is ham that flunked it. Look, there's a lizard called. She's like, I hate to look at the ingredients on that. There's 13 flavors, 13 different kinds. Ham and what? What's the spot? Spot, spot, spot. Ham and vodka. S P A M S P A M. I thank God it's in Korean, so I can't read the uh, <laughs> ingredients. Um, they make their own mistakes, and in marketing things, you know, spam was a hit. But um, oh, spiced ham, I suppose, is what the GIs thought they were doing. Yeah, spam. Uh, they came up with one called cream product. Now, this is coming from them to us. Never worked. Um, whatever's called Madison Avenue there, bad idea, creep. <laughs> Just didn't take in North America. Creep. Spelled <laughs> like the word? Didn't work. Didn't work. Uh, so, yeah, it's creamer for your coffee. Right? They thought they were creating a universal product that would um, take the globe by storm, but 
<laughs> we had to advise them that this English doesn't work. Come up with something else. It's Gallic. It's popular in South Korea. In South Korea? It's uh, popular? They tried this in Japan and it didn't work uh, uh, as an export. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. They tried this one, another loser, post water. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> You, know, you gotta advise them, the, the, the promo department, that some things don't translate in English. Uh, leave the leave the uh, leave the Chinese on the can, that and we maybe get it with a picture. But to say, try my post water. What does it mean? What's inside? It's a ionized drink. It's you know it's supposed to be better than water. A sparkling sparkling water. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Loser, won't work. <laughs> Call us first before you ship us this. Um, so America loses in some in some areas with some of the stuff we send. Uh, I can't imagine how uh, beef jerky goes down. But it's truly an American sort of um, export that may take off. So sometimes Mad Madison Avenue wins, sometimes they lose. I don't know what the equivalent of Madison Avenue is there, but mm. Saatchi and Saatchi was one of the big firms. Mm. All right, let's move ahead and to another zone in our travels. What oh, works? Wow. Solar. Coca-Cola. Coke never lost. Coke. Yay. Well, Coca's got a big investment in that now. Who has it? Warren Buffett. American ah. Coca-Cola, right? Yeah, Coke, yes. you lose your hope. If Warren invests, there must be something to it. But this one, why can't we learn from them? <laughs> Solar panel <laughs> to electrify and cool the soda. Mm -hmm. Now, if they can think of that here, and it is, after all, Coca-Cola of <laughs> Korea, why can't we do it? Here, why don't we cool the soda with a solar panel? I know we have cold days, but this is not exactly a tropical country. Korea, Japan. Well, put it on the city hall roof. You know, get the sun. 24 hours somehow, put it on Navy Pier. Bring back the cigarette vending machines, solar powered. Oh. There, that'd be mercy. Bring the solar power. Progressive cigarette vending machine. You'll never see another one. <laughs> but I liked it, and I thought, again, this is why I travel to see ideas and come back and say, why can't we do that? And tell my friends, why aren't we doing this particular thing? Um, sodas were about the same, a little more expensive. A little more expensive. They've got to import the uh, ingredient, especially for Coke, the secret ingredient, and they've got to use the logo. So uh, Asia will pay more per Coke to bring it in, so the consumer will pay more to drink that. But they've got their own. They can try their own inventions. You want some more soup? Can anyone tell me what that Bukhari sweat means? I hope that wasn't our idea. No, Bukhari sweat? It's an ionized drink. It's That's supposed to rejuvenate you after you've um, worked out. Yeah, I can open it. In the summer, you know, this is a oh, can of Bukhari sweat and rebuild yourself today. And I thought, oh, what a name for a failure. Bad idea. Sun mist I like. That's a winner. Sun mints can't go wrong. Very optimistic. Another tip. Uh, well, yeah. Oh, so I got a teleprompter there. Um, Tim turned it away. He's a genius at technology. He's the kind of guy you want in the orchestra pit if you're giving a present. Yeah, I go to a movie. And I go out to the lobby, I said, I want to get a snack, just wait here. I said to my wife, I'll be back with snacks. So I'm thinking, yeah, I'll get a candy bar or I'll get popcorn. Well, roast squid. What is a squid? Oh. <laughs> well, a squid is like an octopus, but it's poor man's octopus. 
inky kind of thing. Oh, you squid. Ooh. Um, cheese nacho. I was happy to see a Mexican venue. Here I have it in a Korean movie theater. They got the world covered. <laughs> Popcorn ice cream. God, I can't imagine how they did that. I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a split menu. They got the slash there. Popcorn well, ice cream. See the split? Oh, that's the calorie count. If you think we're the only ones counting calories, they have ingredient revelation where you have to list content. And I, again, traveled to say, hey, they do it here. I thought we invented it, and they got calorie counts. Very good. People are engorging themselves anyway on this job. Um, it's made out of rice. Dried squid. Yeah, somehow they get the popcorn into this. And it, it'd be like having pecan ice cream, I suppose. The crunches. All right, and sweet chestnuts. I haven't seen these since I visited Philadelphia. So all these teens are rushing the snack stand, and I'm, I'm standing back. What do they need? What? Should I buy that? And so, anyway, choose your snack. And I was surprised to see more English on the poster than yeah. Korean. So it gives me a clue that these teenagers can take it either way, English or in Korean. They're completely bilingual when it comes to print information. Not completely, but far out of us in our Korean. All right. <laughs> How about another Mr. Microphone? All right, to my surprise, and Protestants wouldn't go for this, but you can buy beer out of vending machine. Wow. wow. Pennsylvania is the only state that still has government stores to sell you liquor in the U.S. And all over um, Asia, they're selling beer out of the vending machine. So again, it's 12 o'clock at night. You can't go down to the bar, you're in your pajamas, right? Just like I'll have a ramen and a beer, and I'll only walk five steps from my door. Because you get, you can get ramen out of a machine, you know, the cup noodle, and you can get this tall, this is a tall boy, I call it. 16 ounce uh, can of cold beer right down the hall near the ice machine. Um, in a hotel. And that's beer. That's not our beer, that's their beer, their brand. Um, by the way, you can also get not only uh, iced coffee out of the machine, you can get hot coffee. Now it doesn't drip in one of those wax cups, it's a hot can of coffee. What's the benefit of that when you're waiting for a bus? Huh. There's no uh, liquor uh, restrictions on the beer? Nope. No liquor restrictions on the beer. Sorry, I guess they trust their teenagers not to spend their allowance on the beer. Wow. But you're going to pay four or five dollars for that can, so eventually the money gets back to the state in, in, in Texas. No, what's your? You've been on a CTA. It's January. You can get your Dunkin' Donut cup, but what do you get out of a hot can of beer? I mean, a hot can of coffee. <laughs> It warms your hands. Think about that value-added value-added factor. I'll get a hot can of coffee. My hands are freezing. I forgot my gloves and the bus is late. Bus is late. I make another note. If I hadn't come here, I wouldn't have seen that. Why doesn't someone in America make a hot can of coffee mm -hmm. in a vending machine? It's one of those little surprises of travel. Even Rick Steves hasn't seen that. <laughs> Let's take another look. Food. You know, if you travel, food is the Here's another trick, another spin. Yeah, it's our Oak Brook McDonald's. But the Asians take it a step further and say, why not deliver? And I thought, of course. Why not deliver? And you say, well, all that junk going out to offices and homes. Well, there's salads now. <laughs> there's salads now and shakes and, uh, well, mixture, fruit drinks, whatever is healthy now. They're trying to put a new face on McDonald's. And I thought, but it took this franchise to think about 
why don't we put it in a hot box and bring it to an office? <laughs> yeah. Now, I didn't speak well enough to go in, but I sure wanted to say to the manager, what's the fee to bring it to my office? Is it an extra 501, 1,001? And if that's all it is, somebody here better get on it and start delivering. How much is that? Uh, about about uh, 501 would be about about six or eight dollars. Yeah, and I, I could take that if I had a hungry bunch of kids waiting for lunch and I had to really get it out. I'd call them up. Can't be any worse than a pizza, right? With all that mozzarella and pepperoni. So I thought, damn good idea. And I got one more shot, Tim. Tim. Tim's having his McToast. <laughs> there. A whole fleet of the things. I, I couldn't get over it. I thought, this isn't just one guy's idea. Here's five ready to go. And they just put the, uh, I like it because even they fought this out. This is where you open the door. You slap the food in and you close it. So your back, the driver's back, is on the food, on the food door. Also keeping him warm, isn't it? <laughs> And, and, and so somebody at a stoplight can't slide something out the door or in velocity that the stuff falls out the door. You flip this open, you slide the food in, and you close it, rest your back on it, and get up to the office floors. Great idea. They take the American product one step further. Clever. Let's go on. What do we got next? Maybe we'll get out of, we're almost out of merchandising now. But this place, I thought, was the Maxwell Street of Korea. Uh -huh. I thought, what does this remind me of? All these tables full of the old way of merchandising. You no know, barcodes. It's like flea market? It's flea market, but they're there every day selling socks. And it's not junk. It's not just junk from the basement. So they still have the old style market like we have on Sundays. On now it's near Canal Street. It's not even There's flames. Next one anymore. Yeah, you know, because Bill spent two or three years trying to defend and keep the old Maxwell Market. Well, all I had to do was go to uh, Seoul to see the market one more shot, and I found oh, I didn't bring my Gangnam socks. This is that little guy that was popular two years ago. Oh, Gangnam, Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dance, dance. Right? It's very popular. Come on, show us. Gangnam it's Style. Still well, I have to be about 100 pounds bigger because this guy's pretty chunky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the marvel on the K-pop shows is that this guy who's about 225 can dance with all these athletic girls behind him. Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. <laughs> So here's the new Elvis of Asia. Can we listen? Can we can we hear this music, Gangnam Style? Uh, I'll, I'll pull it up at the end of his oh, presentation. Oh, good. Will you show him? Yeah, very good. Will you show him? He's a real innovator. Oh, yeah, we'll 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 pull it up on YouTube if you can get a wide shot. It's beautiful. Oh, Rob Rose. It's rock and roll. Well, sure, they lived through that. Now they're giving it back to us their way. It's electronic. It's stand up and dance. It's very, very nice. Time. So I had to buy one of these things, and I gave it to my uh, my niece, and she said, "Oh, I saw that two years ago." She said, "That's that's not going to be around." And I thought, "You little marketer." <laughs> she said, "It won't stay. It won't stay. Now wow. it's whatever they like now. Now it's who's that pretty boy that 13, 16? Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber. She said, it "Looks better." He says, "He's too." Oh, he was around two years ago too. He's too heavy. Yeah, I guess <laughs> Justin's waiting for a new remake. Okay, that's the end of the market and merchandising. Yeah. <laughs> now we go to services, and they did a fascinating job with services. This is a screen in the mall. And imagine walking through Water Tower Place, and maybe you've done it. Help me with this, where this is happening in America. I sort of saw it at the Lakers, what are they called? The Lakers Staples. Staples Center. They had one of those big screens of Staples in LA. But it wasn't showing the people like this is. This is showing the people walking through the mall 
with their kids, and it's all very, very family oriented. But these folks <coughs> were so amazed at seeing themselves on the screen. And I thought, well, what the hell then? You know, where we work, we see that in the lobbies to make sure we're not stealing things. <laughs> what, what's so fascinating? Tim, answer, what's so fascinating about this? And I realized, well, you can bubble things in. Can you advance that? Tim? Gundam style. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, they, they put animation groping up the screen. So now you've got coral in front of you, and you've got little fish blip, 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 by, by you. And I thought, come on, this is supposed to be cutting out. It's the land of, Sam, land of Samsung. Huh. But people are just thrilled with this. There's me. That's my sister. We're being filmed. <laughs> and I couldn't quite get it. Uh, being a historian, the only thing I could think about are the first mirrors during the Renaissance. Uh, uh, there's myself. It's or, you, right? This there's is my child. It's yeah, you, right? good eye. eye. So here I am, taking a picture of me so taking a picture. <laughs> get it? it? It's like one of those M.C. Escher uh, drawing yeah, posters, psychedelic sense. things. Wow. So people were thrilled about it. I remember the first time I went to China, they hadn't seen these uh, cameras that we had, these digital cameras, and peasants were like touching it, or peasants were looking over <laughs> your shoulder. That's me. Jungle. You took a picture of me. Well, here we are in 2014, but they're fascinated. They were fascinated by it. And I thought, what? Where's the beef? Well, it's not beef, it's yeah. advanced one more, and we'll see how it ends up. Wow. Ah. Wow. We'll get back to that screen thing in a minute. <laughs> Another clever way to repackage something we've already <laughs> given from the West is trick art. <laughs> right? Trick art. What does it take to think here? You know, we, we bring them to the Art Institute. Uh, they look. They look at the painting. Many, many of us are inspired by the painting, but someone goes a little further in Korea and says, what if I could walk into the painting? <clears throat> oh, what if I could pretend I was on the starry wow. night boulevard of mm. Van Gogh? Mm. And I thought, my God, I'll pay to go in and do that. Wow. You're taking a Western product and you're adding value. And you're coming up with a new way of giving it back. So Tim, take me down the Boulevard Saint Germain here yeah. to anywhere I want to go. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. This All right. Is cute. I'm chatting with Van Gogh in Van Gogh's room. Wow. Right. I think Gauguin lived there. So I sit down on a chair. It's a 3D chair in front of the 2D picture, and by God, I, I'm. Writing myself in the picture, as they say. <laughs> Give me another one, Tim. This stuff just gets better and better. It's called Van Stop. Van Stop? Style? Van Style. This is Vermeer. Uh, no, not Vermeer. Fragonard, French painter. Oh, we've seen these in textbooks. Well, the kid gets excited about touching it and getting into the painting. The kid may in time... Remember, this is an important piece of art. This is actually not a kid, it's my wife. So she, is, she got me into this, so here I am trying to make the most of it in Korea. Let's see one more. We got one more. Well, this little kid said, uh, this is the Vermeer, and he, um, his mom said, stand under the milk pitcher, take your picture. Well, I'm hoping to translate that the kid is going to see that painting in the Rijksmuseum, Rijksmuseum or in Holland or in the Louvre and say, yeah, I know that painting. So Vermeer, so it's, it's doing something with something already been produced. My goodness. Quite amazing. Let's go on to, uh, I think we're... All right, here comes America. I, I you know, kept searching for American products that work. 
And one that's gotten over big in Korea is Chevy. Hmm. You know, when I saw the Chevron, I thought, we're here, for God's sake, we're beating Kia and Hyundai. Well, yes and no. Sometimes I think they let a few in to keep our trade officials happy. I think it's a closed market, and it's not really free market capitalism when it comes to automobiles, especially in a young industry like Kia's and Hyundai's. Hyundai's. <laughs> because they consider themselves the infants compared to Ford and Chevy. And they still dominate through tariffs, other little little sleight of hands. And Obama should get angrier about it. I'm, I'm sorry that he's not strong enough about making sure Korea buys more American product. He's all balled up with uh, North Korea and what we're going to do on the bases and forgetting about Amer good old American production. Because we got a Hyundai here and we got the Kia there, but Chevy still, Chevy broke in the market. You know, it's still pretty powerful. Yeah. It's pretty Big and powerful? powerful? Very powerful. You know, comparison like something about this car look like very, oh, very nice. This is a wimp because uh, the big the big ones that you'd want to buy for, for prestige were the Hyundais, the Sonatas. But at least we got the small end in, and I was happy to see it. We got another one. We got, uh, yeah, there, the spark. And you know, not a household word here, but at least I think the Koreans think it's now. But all of those cute little American cars, that's how they got here a long time ago, was Honda making cute little e kind of boxes. Datsun. All right, or Datsun, remember that. <laughs> so. All right, the Chevy got in the market. Happy yes. about that. Well, going I'm, back, sir. I'm sorry. Right. Strong. Yeah, it is strong. Going back. There we go. I mean, does it have serious radio, and does it have all? Chevrolet. Um, I found a dealer outlet. I found a dealer outlet. I wanted to go to just go in and say congratulations. You got some dealer bases here. I hope you can beat Kia. But to my surprise, something else that caught my eye. Graffiti. Graffiti. The only graffiti I had seen in Korea was on this subway uh, railing to go down underneath into the Seoul subway. And I thought, hmm, did we export that? Is it our fault? No. I don't know. I think it's their idea of being hip. Teenagers, I mean. Oh, I'll spray something. Yeah. Because they don't have a big problem with gangs in Korea. They have other problems, other addictions, um, you know, problems and uh, domestic violence. But I was surprised to see this. And um, take a look at the exhibit at Chicago Street Museum on Chicago in the 70s right now. You'll see people getting into the State Street subway. There's more graffiti on the train than there is silver paint. So much graffiti. And I thought, Daily cleaned that up somehow, got the graffitis off the train. They were in the inside. It was all over. You're trying to read the newspaper. You think you were in the fun house. So we've reduced the subway graffiti here, but only to see a rise maybe in Asia. It's still offensive no matter what culture you put it in. Uh, nobody told anyone to spray paint glass for Christ's sake. All right, let's go to a. There's a fence with some of the buildings. Yes. Let's go to a, a gas. Yeah, gas prices. Uh, I thought, well, this is cheap, not bad. Well, it was about four U.S. dollars per liter. <laughs> And then I had to realize, wait, four liters 16. to a gallon. So, $16, no. so $16 dollars summer, per imperial gallon. Oh, uh, imperial gallon, we call that in Canada? Or we call in, that Canada. in Canada. In Canada. They used to for, call that in Great Britain, but not anymore. They thought it the imperial gallon. No imperial, just gallon. No, it's the metric system right now. So, you know, it was costly, but they had boys coming out, filling your tank, wiping your windows. 
we traded that. We thought, I'll take the cheaper gas, let Grandma pump it herself. That's something in America. I don't know why we can't have an attendant or a self-serve. I saw one in Bridgeport. There is one. In New Jersey, there's a... Oh, there is? Awful serve in New Jersey. Some states have laws that you have to give full serve for older people. Illinois says every everyone on your own, you know, we'll sell you a candy bar in the store, but we won't pump your gas, Grandma. Come on. I think there's one company that sells There's one that sells propane and all down on Western Avenue. He still comes out. I said, what are you doing to my car? He said, I'm putting your gas in, sir. He still puts the gas in. It's two brothers trying to run us. Anyway. There's one on McHenry, too. Oh. Wow, we gotta go there just to get the. Do you know the brand? The, uh, it's a mobile station, an old time, old time one out near Island Lake. Go for the tired guy. They clean your window. He, clean, you know, he doesn't get much business anymore, but it's a referee. Uh, I think. Uh, he's a Brown. Uh, yeah. Am I going over? Yeah. Um, okay. It's let's let's uh. Let's flash, flash, fret, flash, fry through. <laughs> All right, the last ones are on our political front. Um, the DMZ zone. And let's have a look at, uh, yeah, let's take, let's skate through some of these. These are our allies. Um, you know, it's debatable. It's, uh, they call themselves the UN Command. They're policing the armistice or policing the truce that never was settled on where North Korea stops and South Korea begins. So flash through some of these, Tim, and we'll take a look at our present state of affairs. I don't think he liked me taking his picture, but I did it anyway. Look very, very Yeah, he's a South Korean guard. Let's take another. And there's his Republic of Korea, the rock, tells us where he's from, and this tells us we're in the UN ceasefire area. Well, I had to take the bus up and see, and the hotel says, yeah, we can get you in a bus trip, it's going to cost you $40, you have to go and be heavily inspected, no cameras. Mm, you know, hands out of the pocket, don't take any metal things in or you'll never come back. So I went up. Let's see what happens. Okay. We get uh, uh, Checkpoint Charlie here. You know, they have this cute picnic umbrella that someone's going to sit and, and bring the family. But uh, neat little, uh, little gazebo there and keep going. And we cross. And they gave me this great little badge so that they could keep my their eye on me. And I tried to, like, keep it for a souvenir. And he said, where's your badge? On the way out, where's your badge? Can't get it without the badge. I thought, oh, here, sir, gave me back the badge. Can't keep that. What is it for? Well, you know, if it closes at 6 o'clock at night and you're in there, you know, you're who? What country do you belong to? The DMZ. The dividing line, the UN imaginary line that separates the two cultures. And right now, it's a hard and fast line. Okay, we'll get a couple more shots of the DMZ and we'll finish. Yeah. And, and um, joint security area, they call it. Gift shop. Gift shop? Well, yeah, yeah they sold some of that. They had the marine emblem here. Gee, I, I don't think I need. They have the, the UN emblem there. Uh huh. How about North Korea teachers? I probably got them too, I'm sure. I'm sure they work for the pay they're given without union. North, North Korean teachers, no. South Korean teachers make a good dollar. It's civil service. Now, what, yeah, here's the South Korean guard in the UN blue helmet looking at the North Korean consulate. Um, and that was the only guard. He didn't look very imposing to me that this was the North Korea guard. And he even kind of stood in the corner. He didn't dominate 
central doorway. Well, if you could considerably get out of here and cross the line, you're free. But, you know, the, the, this is the anniversary of the Berlin Wall, the falling of the Berlin Wall. Lots of cameras, lots of electronics. And this guy's paid a salary as a civil servant to watch this soldier, who's probably paid in potatoes and rice. And um, so it's the North squaring off with the United Nations forces, which is U.S. quite a bit, advisors, strategists, and a lot of um, South Koreans on the front carrying their weapon. At 17, you're drafted. You have no choice on the South side. You're going to have to cut your hair and quit the K-pop and the Gangnam style. And you got to put on the uniform and do your two years. And every boy has two. I don't know about the girls, but in the U.S. we're more equitable about that. I don't think there are girls, ladies, women. And on the north side, I don't know, you're probably working hard to feed that guy to stay healthy on the front. Because their economy is in quite a shambles on the north side. For reasons you could blame from boycotts to um, international boycotts to just doing a pretty bad job of farming under Kim, boy Kim. They have talks, here's a series of round table. They have talks and party and members are still talking. Here's China's seat next to Canada's seat. Trying to decide, can they resolve this thing peacefully? No. I, I used to think no, and, and we'll do that in the Q&A. Uh, well, yeah, I still think no. <laughs> It's a pretty intractable situation, but right now we're tied down with Syria and some pretty, pretty big problems in Iraq. All right, another. So much for the DMC. Some Chinese officials like uh, Lee Pin have visited and the president of South Korea trying to have talks. What's his name? This is Lee Pin, but that was before the current. No, South Korean. And I want to say Park. Uh, Park is out. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Book. We have oh, we have a a female prime minister. I never thought in a traditionalist country like Korea that they would have a female prime minister. And America is still working on that. So, Germany, Germany's got theirs, and Korea has theirs. Let's take a. Uh, and here's our leader. At the front, and I'm wondering what Obama's saying. He's saying, "Now that's South Korean. This is South <laughs> no, no, sir. Let me but no, that's North Korean. That's South Korean. No, I shouldn't, I shouldn't joke about it. But really, he's got his Air Force One jacket, and his policy is called uh, Turnabout to Asia, the new Turnabout to Asia. He's been talking about for two years." Pivot toward Asia, thank you. Which hasn't kept Latin America very happy because for the past six years he's been pivoting to Asia and the Middle East and he hasn't done very much in Latin America. So be careful, Mr. Obama, on that. Well, I'll stop there with our six aspects of life in Korea from retailing to the DMZ. Let us thank our speaker. <laughs> oh, listen, I have a question. Did you, did you go, did you, did you buy tour or you go by yourself? Was just uh, like, uh, you know, by yourself? Uh, to go, to go to the south, anyone can go. To go to the north, package? you need a uh, package to get on the bus. Uh, no, I'm talking about... And a passport. The, uh, no, uh, Back and forth trip. You, you, you buy a package or you go by just like by yourself? Oh, just by myself. And, mm -hmm. and my wife said, um, I can help with translation. She said, Don't worry. Can you tell me how Anyone much? Anyone can go. Ah, oh, $2,000. All right. Round trip. That's right. Well, she, uh, how about the, the health care in the Korea? Is it similar to China or is it more I westernized? I could not get into a hospital to. Um, determined, but some families felt pretty confident and secure they had health care and didn't say they were 
dynamics <coughs> there, operational or anything like that. So I feel they've got a national system worked out. Do you win? Yeah. Uh, about 25 years ago, I read an article about the South Korean government persecuting the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church in Korea was responding much as it had under the Romans. Did you see anything like that? No, 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 because the fastest growing religion in South Korea is not Buddhism, of course, uh, it's, it's Protestantism. And the Methodists are just, uh, well, I'll use their word, on fire there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pulling away. Largest Protestant Fire church in the world is in Seoul. Buddhists, um, very strong and ardent. I'm not sure what it is in the culture that makes Korea so ardent toward Protestantism or even Christianity, um, having been a Buddhist country. I have a question. Right, uh, Gullar, Reverend. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering whether you saw alternative medicine propaganda or advertising there, and uh, special, especially if they advertise fecal transplants. Transplants? Yeah, fecal transplants. Does that mean getting kicked in the ass? No, that means uh, taking fecal matter from somebody and shove it up to your ass. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would not. This is that for shit. That's not... Uh, what does that have to do with plastic It's a shit. scientific thing because what happened is that in our <laughs> intestine we have different flora and it's so sensitive even for example if you eat at different times different days of the week it yeah. will affect the way that you digest because this bacteria, bacteria. It, it's affected by when do you eat at what time and so on they don't have uh, what's called medical tourism there in korea but you know canada and um Costa Rica are doing a big business in medical tourism. So um, you're speaking of something that's growing in the world. We are behind everybody, right? Uh, yes, Pat Butler. Yeah, uh, as an American visitor in South Korea, you undoubtedly had a lot of questions. Uh, were you pretty much free to ask whatever questions you liked, or were there some things that uh, uh, you were just discouraged from asking. Oh, it's a free speech situation in the Western idea of free speech, free press. Hello? Um, but yeah, I at one point I asked a cab driver, what do you think he passed the bases? He passed the bases, which by the way were built by the Japanese. I don't know if this is prophetic, but they were built by the Japanese in the 30s. And after the Japanese lost World War II and, and were moved out of Korea, the U.S. said, well, here's some bases and airports, we'll take these. So a lot of the U.S. GIs are on the bases. So I said, what do you think about these American bases? He said, oh, we try not to think about it. <laughs> now that told me a lot. That said a lot to me. Uh, he didn't get belligerent and say, oh, are you one of those Americans? But he said, we try not to think about that. That's not the future right now. And he kept driving and I shut up. But, but South Korea has free speech. North Korea is another situation. As Dennis Rodman can say what he wants. But. Uh, Tim Bolger. It's been said that South Korea has some of the best Wi-Fi and Internet access. Did you notice the proliferation of cell phones and iPhones with the young down oh, there? Very popular. And I used to boast that Motorola had the edge with the Razer phones. Uh. Samsung has pulled ahead. Samsung has pulled ahead. And that's why I titled this talk, uh, Cutting Edge Competitor or Cold War Captive. They're not really living in the Cold War. They're cutting edge competitors. And South Korea politically is capitalist economically, but they sure get along with China because when they get a good idea, or when we get a good idea and Korea adapts it, they then send production to China. And China's very willing to put together the new Samsung phone and ship it back to or the parts back to Korea, where they assemble and export. So there's a symbiosis going on there. Very strange bedfellows. We have China and South Korea 
cozy. And to some degree, that's pushed North Korea to make some new friends with Japan. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised to say, where Japan is starting to send supply uh, parts to North Korea, mm. because North Korea is so hungry for foreign capital. As a, okay. This way. This way. Back Tracy. to our journalist. Uh, Tracy McClellan. Yeah, yeah, this way. I, I don't know if this is off topic or not. Nothing is. Uh, but you've made a couple of critical, oblique references to North Korea. Yeah. Not having freedom of speech. Yeah. Um, the economy is really bad. I've read reports from a reporter that I have a lot of respect for who says that North Korea is a more democratic society than certainly the United States, but that wouldn't be difficult, would it? And that it's a vi much more vibrant culture than we're led to believe by the Western press. Uh -huh. Can you comment on that at all? Probably, uh, yes, that we are starved for, we are starved for accurate news in North Korea, <laughs> partly because they closed the door. You're not going to be Ted Koppel, you're not going to walk in and be uh, Geraldo Rivera and get much coverage there. But Stansfield Smith goes there. And Stansfield last weekend said to me when we were eating here that he was permitted to go to places. But I think it's something of a um, to speak on North Korea's behalf, they're surrounded. China doesn't want to know the bad boys anymore because China's working on their own deals. The South wants to reunite Korea and don't want to talk with them until they tear down the wall, so to speak. So the new boy prime minister is confused on what to do. And it's at the cost of the common person who you get no exports, and you're not importing anything. And you know, it's a downward spiral. You can blame it on capitalist isolation. You can also blame it on family dynasty. I, I, I don't think an election is what we call an election in North Korea. So there's a lot of factors there. A lot of factors there. I'm encouraged that Rodman went over. Maybe that's the beginning of ping pong diplomacy that Nixon opened the door with. Mm -hmm. All right, Bill? Yeah. Uh, some years ago, I would read a journalist by the name of I.F. Stone, who wrote a book about the hidden history of the Korean War and would mention it in his newsletter every so often. Are you all familiar with him? Well, I.F. Stone was respected, but he was yeah. um, investigating Nixon shenanigans over Vietnam, okay. and he's gone. I mean, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have stopped. Uh, uh, let's see. Sit yeah. Cohen. Yeah, um, okay. There's a lot of tension between North and South, especially that the North got the atomic bomb. Oh. Is, yeah. Do they feel it in South Korea? Do they talk about it or anything like that? Uh, they should worry. And Japan has earthquake drills where kids in school put on helmets and get under desks. And I think, in, in my opinion, uh, North, uh, South Korea should have uh, nuclear, nuclear drills. But I walked through a school and did not see, did not see uh, helmets in the lockers or anything. Um, so there seems to be a confidence that somehow we can talk our way through this problem. But the young Kim isn't going away. You know, it's a dynasty. Dynasty, that family control that doesn't work very well with tyrants, you know, with uh, Saddam Hussein legacy and uh, in Syria, that long legacy. Uh, you need a change of power before things are going to happen, a change of leaders. But yeah, they should be worried about limited tactical nuclear war because it could come. Uh, I, I see you, Bill and, and Pat. But uh, Margaret has not had a question yet. Uh, would you consider Margaret? Uh, Margaret, Margaret did it. Oh, Margaret also one fool at a time. Uh, I've read a lot about lack of opportunity for women in Japan. Is it the same situation in South Korea, or do they have a chance to get up to be like managers and so forth? 
That's a tougher question um, because I couldn't get into a corporation and observe. In a hotel, I was amazed to see, I watched a meeting very closely for body language because you could tell who was the boss. He got the head position at the dinner table. But I was interested to see a woman was at the table for a change. You would not see that 20 years ago at, at a manager's meeting. She was at the table, and the young man was taking the, the notes as secretary. So that told me a lot. That means the woman is at the table. She's not heading the corporation, but she's at the table, and the man has the pencil, and he's taking the notes. But he's a young man. So, you know, they're going by age now instead of, well, you're a woman, make tea. And honest to God, this was 20 years ago. Make tea for the guys who are having a meeting. Now she's at the table, and she sacrificed a lot to get to that table, believe me, the hours she has to put in to sit at that table. But the young boy out of college with the suit was taking the notes that told me a lot about how Asian pecking order is changing. All right. what? She's getting a chance. She's not in the boardroom yet. She's not running. She's not a CEO, Based but she's... Age, not a sex so much. Is that what you yes. yeah. Based on age, which is a long Asian tradition. Would you consider North Korea more or less the equivalent of ISIS, which is already being dealt with by an international coalition to get rid of? Now, do you think there ought to be some kind of international coalition to get rid of North Korea? It would be messy, it would be bloody, and China wouldn't want to see it destabilized because it's a close neighbor of China. They won't sit still for Canada, South uh, Korea, and North Korea, and a little bit of Europe to roll over, roll in. It would be a bloody mess. I think it would be a bloody uh, situation. Obama's right that when things get hot, there has to be some more talk and negotiation before you start firing away like George Bush in the first term. Firing away. Mission accomplished. Okay. We Ron, we should, we should yeah, go we to should get the rebuttals. Okay. Uh, Was there a question? After. Yeah. Uh, Baby Kim uh, has uh, demonstrated over the last couple of years especially uh, a great deal of instability. His government has sunk one South Korean uh, warship. Uh, he has made threatening maneuvers uh, along the uh, border. Yeah. He has threatened U.S. Uh, and U.N. forces. Uh, in the event that he were to go a little bit overboard and decide to invade South Korea, which is conceivable, uh, would the South Korean forces, the ROK, yeah. be capable of defending the country, or would the United States have to go in again, as we did in 1950, uh, with very, very uh, ambiguous results? Uh, I'll get the crack at that one. Yeah. China would be right by us. Yeah, yeah, you know. And uh, the reason I say that is because of the increased ties of globalization and yeah. the amount of government that they hold on us. I think that's a good answer. That the new game, the new game board is that China would take him in to the office and talk to him, yeah. calm him down. Mm -hmm. You know, you use one surface to air missile, you will not use another one. Uh, uh, China's worried about. You know, it's like taking the pet pup. And the pet pup is cute when you first adapted him, and now he's sort of a mongrel dog, and China doesn't know what to do about this family run amok. He doesn't know what to do about the mole, the new boy prime minister. They, you know, do we contain him? Do we disown him? Do we ignore him? I think that they would somehow rein him in, but there could be some bloodshed. I think um, the State Department's level-headed enough not to start uh, world War over it. But there's a hell of a lot of espionage going on on both sides. All right. Uh, People are now going in a uh, third we run. We are, I think, ready for our rebuttal period. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's thank our speaker again. Oh. Good audience. Uh, Following. Uh,
How many first buckets do we have? I'm in the bag. He's not You don't You're the only. Yeah, I'm going to be the only. Oh, yeah. Because this guy, you are too big for him. Okay. Well, Sid Gaster, first, uh, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, if you could get a, a hold of IF stones, the hidden history of the Korean War, you get a good idea of how this thing started. Now, there were raids back and forth between North Korea and South Korea for maybe a year or a half a year, I don't know exactly how long. And then about a week or two before the war started, you had Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, right on the border with generals there. And then the, uh, the, North, the South Koreans invaded North Korea. And what they were really after was not North Korea. They were after China. Because if you remember what happened uh, in front of the Senate or the Congress, whatever it was, they were talking about how the United States lost China. And China, of course, was a semi-colony of a lot of different countries, but towards the end, it was a semi-colony of the United States for the most part. I had a friend of mine who was a Marine, and he was guarding uh, Standard Oil installations in China. The United States is an imperialist country, and it has about 800 bases around the world. It produces 41% of all the armaments in the world. So when the war starts, it's usually the United States imperialism that starts it. And China's policy is to trade with all countries, irrespective of their uh, internal policies. And what it's trying to do is have peace with everybody around the world. Now, you notice the United States always boycotts this country and boycotts that country because it tries to control all these countries. Right now, it's, it's trying to get into Russia. So uh, it's already into Syria, into all the Middle East and so forth. They got kicked out of, of, of South America, and so there are other countries trying to take over. Well, the whole idea of the United States imperialism is to control the world, but it's all backfiring. The whole thing is backfiring. The more they try to get in, the more it backfires against them. And uh, I think the United States is really going down. The economy is, is way down there. They talk about the increase in uh, employment, but only 100, 1%, all the wealth is going to them. And the average worker in the United States, his, his salary keeps going down, down, down. So no matter how much they tell you about employment, that doesn't mean anything. Huh. All right. Oh, yeah. Man. No matter okay. what they tell you. Oh, I'm, I'm timing at four. I'm timing prom. Yeah, about 10 years ago, I heard a talk by Bruce Cummings, a University of Chicago professor who's something of an expert on Korea. Uh, one of the things that struck me was the sadness of a delighted country. That's remained my impression ever since. And while I'm ordinarily very much opposed to interventionist war, I think against uh, ISIS or North Korea, I can make an exception. Uh, war against North Korea, the main danger there is that one of their nuclear weapons will get off. And I think every possible uh, precaution should be taken to prevent that. But I think some kind of international coalition should do to North Korea what India did to Goa. I don't think North Korea is capable of sustained war. Uh, I think it, 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 it just don't have the supplies. 
And I don't think he has the popular support. Mm -hmm. I guess that's about it. All right, all right, all I right. have a question. A question. Right. No question. You mentioned ISIS. Yeah. All right, what, do you think maybe it would be a good idea, a better idea to not give the money in the first place? Instead of giving the money and then worrying about it? I don't think about, either of them should be giving the money. Well, well they used to get money from the U.S. Well, as well as the Taliban. The U.S. supports two sides of a lot of things, but uh, I still don't think either of them be getting any money from anybody. Fine. All right, this is my first time uh, up here. I'm a little nervous. <clears throat> South Korea, good, good, uh, good uh, uh, presentation for Peter. South Korea makes some great products: Samsung, Hyundai, LG, etc. These are great products with great quality. So my my uh, uh, takeoff is. Don't get dumbed down by that. Uh, by USA, uh, it's helping the USA. It's just the opposite, or 180 degrees. If you buy USA only, it promotes extreme complacency. If you say that you're going to buy a Honda Accord, and the USA automakers see that Honda is the most reliable car, it forces the USA to raise their quality and to even surpass foreigners. The same with Samsung Electronics or LG, like your stove or your fridge. One example, another example of great American ingenuity was in 61 when uh, Kennedy, he mentioned about the American determination to surpass uh, uh, Russia when they were the first one in space. President Kennedy challenged the United States to surpass the Russians by being the first to land a man on the moon. And yes, we did it from 69 to 72. We did it six times with six moonwalks. So believe me, when you challenge the USA by saying that we're only second best, we dig our heels in. And we're going to do everything to surpass you. Aren't we great? My name is Steve. I want to... Uh, uh, my name is Steve. I'm a newcomer to your great thinking group. I love you guys and gals. You're wonderful. Next topic is I'm going to... A branch off on minimum wage. This is a very hot topic right now. Minimum wage is only for folks with no uh, to very so low skill level. You're not supposed to want to stay at minimum wage jobs. Believe me. You have to ask the question, how can I make more money? The answer is to take on more responsibility or get more skills. Yeah. That's how you make more money in America. The example is Flipping burgers will not make you more money the longer you do it. Anyone can flip hamburgers. We even use that phrase for high school folks that we think are slouches. We ask them the question, what do you want to flip burgers the rest of your life? We ask that question. We use that in everyday life. No one does. So you have to start to get more skills. Operate the fry machine, the uh, drink machine, the cafe area. The, uh, and learn customer service skills. <laughs> and with that skill, you learn how to operate a cash register. And then, the, to be a leader amongst people. The crew will then uh, see, go to you if they have any questions. The supervisor will then see uh, that you have skills and you're good with people. You will then get promoted to be assistant supervisor. That's how it works in America. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Yes. You must add value to the company. Then you get paid more. Oh, yeah. Not using protest signs, that's also no skill. Now, if you're the organizer, if you're the organizer of those sign toters, that's a real skill. That's a real skill. Use that in a company and you'll go places and get raises in your paycheck. I'm going to close with this. Capitalism means Self-sufficiency with sky is the limit. Can you, you can be the janitor all the way to the President of the United States. Or anywhere in between. That's the beautiful part right there. Anywhere in between. Socialism means, this is for Charlie, socialism <laughs> means heavy reliance on others and therefore being subjected to your giver or donor. Their, their whims. But we are very kind and caring and a loving country of capitalists and therefore, as proof of our kindness and love, we have socialism nets all around us. Thank goodness, and that will be my next week's presentation on socialism nets. Thank you. I love you guys and girls. You're a great group. You really are. Thank you, Steve. Where's Peter? You ready? Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Are you where? Are you okay. Can you just put it over there, please? Yeah. Yeah. I'll pick it up. He's for capitalist. Yeah, pork chop with your egg? I've had a troubling sense this evening that many folks here take for granted the dominant, the dominant economic um, and social models. Um, for example, some of us have decried ISIS um, and North Korea, although I don't know what we know about North Korea, given our media. But ISIS, I mean, let's compare. ISIS has killed what? Two dozen? And let's compare that with Obama's drone strikes. They're in the thousands. Which is the worst? Um, ISIS. 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 ISIS is vilified and demonized for beheading people, which is abhorrent. But what about the United States bosom buddy, Saudi Arabia? Yeah. They behead exponentially more people than ISIS does. Um, I'd like to make some responses to this uh, speaker's um, presentation. He drew an analogy of, I think it was ramen noodles, being the new Firestone or Goodyear. Let's remember that corporations like Firestone and Goodyear and the automobile fact, uh, manufacturers and the oil companies brought up a state-of-the-art trolley car system in Los Angeles in 1930 for $5 billion and junked it so that Los Angeles would be reliant on the automobile instead of public transportation. Um, you mentioned new tastes and new ways to make food faster, discounting the economic costs of those things. What does one do with the cup of the ramen noodles after one is done with it? Throws it in the trash? How much landfill do we have? And I realize this is a, a relatively petty part of the problem, but what I'm talking about is the paradigm, the model of consumption without concern for what the costs, especially the, the ecolo ecological costs are. You paid compliments to spam. Let's remember that spam is made by Hormel, which busted a union about 10 years ago. You also mentioned Coca-Cola and a appealing light. Is this the same Coca-Cola that's down in Colombia yeah. stealing the Colombians' water yes, to make is. their sugar water and murdering union activists down there? Yeah. You also mentioned McDonald's in a positive light and their delivery system. Um, I know most of us are carnivores here and I use us uh, in a polite fashion. But does anybody realize how destructive meat, how environmentally destructive meat eating is? If you don't and, I, and you're concerned, I would suggest to you you read an article by one of the best reporters in the world, Chris Hedges. I hope some of you in this room are familiar with Chris Hedges, who three weeks ago wrote an article stating that um, veganism is going to be an imperative. With 7.3 billion people on the planet, heading toward 9 billion by mid-century, the factory farm model is unsustainable. <laughs> One last thing, please. Uh, the gentleman mentioned, in a positive light, what the Indians did to Goa. Is that when the Hindus went in there and, and massacred the Muslims? No. Because that happened in Goa, right? No. Mm. Yeah, it did. That, that, that did not happen. Yes, it did. It did not. Okay. You want the documentation? Okay. Are you here next week? All right, thank you. Yeah. 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 Only one thing I have to say about North Korea. Liberate it, normalize it, our relationship, China will scramble. China is more scared of all we North Korea than anything else. Okay? So we normalize North Korea, you know, it will be fine. You know, and, and if we get more prosperous and we'll get cheaper goods. Okay. 
I'm more worried about uh, the last uh, two, three days, what is going on about uh, the Michael Brown and the other tour in New York City. I think uh, <coughs> President Obama should have and should take initiative in a racial relationship and talk to black people and talk to white people. So one of the most important things is there in America, we are a country of law. If cop stops you, you respect the cop and you answer quietly and nicely. And if Michael Brown would have done that, it would not have happened. Please don't steal. So Michael Brown stole from a small guy, so a small convenience store, okay? And nobody talks about that small guy. He, he, he got 35, 40 dollars, he got his day's worth of slavery. If you go out in your pocket, 30, 40, 40 dollars, somebody steals, you scream and call the cops. Okay, so so where where we are, Obama not talking about that guy. He talking about he talking about a guy who stole, but not talking about the guy who got stolen from. Right. Second thing, we we have to have every church, every black church or every church, every leader. Tell, tell, uh, round of applause. I'm not, I I'm not saying that all crimes are black. 50% more crimes are committed by white. Okay, so it is not a thing. But the question is right now on a black. Every church should teach them about the manners with the law enforcement. Every, every church and every leader should talk about how this they should go to school and they should study. Obama should, Obama should have should have gone and trade, told given speeches across the country within black community that hey guys, you got to learn, you got to educate, you got to stop the crime, you got to stop killing. Okay? And Obama had never done that. Kissing a black guy who, who was in trouble, this one guy, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter. it's not going to help. The, in America, half a, what, half a million confrontation happens every year with the cops. Okay? And about 450 people get killed. Okay? Because 450 people we kill every year in Chicago. So there's a not lots of killing. Okay? And we have a, about 60, 60 on an average, 60 cops get killed. That's a lot. But not that many cops there. And it's cops' job. Anybody has ever gone in a cruiser in the evening with the cops? No. Their life is tough. Calls continuously keep on com com coming in about where crime happening, what is happening. I have gone to, I have gone one time Broadway and finally after 20 minutes I said let me get out. Because it was constantly going on, I cannot handle it. Okay, and uh, let, let 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 us. If Obama wants to do it, we need a black people educated, and and Obama should tell the tell the Congress, tell the country, look, you denied us education, you treated us badly, you did bad thing for you, you kept them down, so we let us spend more money on us. Let us spend more money educating black people. And I do not think <coughs> that anybody in a Congress, Republican Party or the Democratic Party, anybody in a Congress or Senate will deny that. You should go and tell it. We, they, they, they can send 10,000 uh, 10, kids to foreign country to be a doctor for a cost of $500 million. That's not lots of money. Okay, and because in a foreign country you can you can train your, you can make a doctor for fifty thousand dollars. Okay, okay, thank you. Good evening. I uh, I heard some talk today about the minimum wage. And I'd like to say that the minimum wage is for the lowest uh, people on the totem in, uh, in the uh, money-earning sector of the country. 
him to mention. But the uh, the lowest educated people who are hello the lowest educated people who earn a minimum wage and, and they're screaming now I see people with signs that say they want fifteen dollars an hour uh, for a, a minimum wage. But the, the fact is that when I was a kid, the minimum wage was a buck and a half an hour, and people got along on that. So, what makes the every time the minimum? Hello. Hello. Don't interrupt. Every time the minimum wage, every time the minimum wage goes up, the value of the money goes down, especially the savings. Oh, did you get your laugh, Charlie? <laughs> Are you done now? Maybe I can finish, please. Uh, every time the minimum wage goes up, the value of the money that you've put, that you have saved in your savings account, goes down. So that if you've worked hard all your life and saved your money, now you're ready to retire and it won't buy nearly. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, an ice cream cone at Baskin and Robbins was. I think 25 cents. Oh. And today it's $4. Oh. So a gallon of gas was 25 cents. Today a gallon of gas is $3 and something. So you see, it isn't the, the uh, wage so much that counts. What counts is how much your money will buy. And your money that you earn isn't going to buy more when they keep raising the taxes more and more. That means that your money is going to buy less and less and less. Because if you the the uh, if the building owner gets a tax increase on his property and he raises the rent, the storekeep has to raise his prices. And when he raises his prices, that means your money's buying that much less. And so the wind-up is that this keeps going over and over and over again. So if they get $15 an hour now, then in another few years, they're going to scream for $20 an hour. And all this is going to do is keep bringing the, the buying power of your money lower and lower and lower. So what is needed is lowering prices and the government does not work to lower prices they work to raise prices because it's part of the scheme of things government spends all they want and more and then they get prices raised so that when it comes time to pay up they pay with dollars that are worth much less and, and this has been a scheme from way back when, and that's all there is to it. Now, I'd like to mention one other thing here before I go. And what I want to mention is this. If you get your blood pressure normalized, and you get your cholesterol normalized, and you get it checked, and it's absolutely normal, I'm going to make you a promise, a solemn promise. If, if you then start eating Raymond noodle soups regularly, I promise you that within two years you'll have high blood pressure and high cholesterol, okay? And by the way, I don't classify that crap as food. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. I can't hear you. Then what's the can do about it? Well, it's can do about what? Like about uh, if, if uh, minimum wage going to be higher, then the uh, price is higher. No, that's so the, okay, the answer to that question is vote libertarian. Okay. Okay. Previous. I told previous speaker. One full at a time. Previous speaker lamented the vilification of the North Korean regime, the vilification of ISIS 
and the American usage of drones uh, to carry out military operations. If he was lamenting that, hold your seats because it has only begun. Let's look at the current ruler of North Korea, Baby Kim. Now, Baby Kim is just not just another spoiled brat. Uh, Baby Kim is a psychopath. Why do I say that? His uncle, his own uncle was one of his victims. He gets into a family feud with his uncle, accuses him of corruption, and sentences him not to an honorable exile or even prison, sentences his own uncle to death. Not unusual in a country like North Korea. What is unusual, what has not been seen perhaps since the days of Caligula or Nero, he sentences him to death by wild dogs. His uncle was stripped naked, thrown into a small arena where Baby Kim, otherwise known by his syncopathic followers as dear one or precious one uh, and his uh, uh, fellow uh, uh, psychopaths sat there watching this man being torn to bits by wild dogs. So much for progressive government. Uh, we also have a case and this was that gleaned in an interview by a Western reporter. It was, it was an interview that was taken by a Chinese reporter uh, People's Republic of China reporter who interviewed a woman after the funeral of baby Kim's father and she was worried that she was going to be arrested because she did not appear to be mournful enough and she stood watching the funeral procession. Um, I have never heard of anybody in the United States being arrested for not being mournful enough at Kennedy's funeral or at Churchill's funeral. Uh, and I heard of no cases of people being arrested during Abraham Lincoln's funeral uh, when this country was in uh, you know, a far, far, far direer straits uh, than uh, any country is today. Uh, ISIS. Um, yes, ISIS uh, beheaded probably about a dozen uh, American and other Western uh, reporters and uh, other individuals, aid workers, that would be bad enough. No, ISIS is in the habit when they go into a town, again, not seen since the days of Tamerlane, they have been known to behead people and pile those heads in pyramids as a lesson to others who would resist them. Uh, this completely, completely transcends anything resembling civilized warfare. If this were a conventional war, the leaders of ISIS would be promptly on trial for war crimes and would be hanged, not shot, that's an honorable death, hanged like dogs, like the dogs or the swine, they should be considered. Now. As far as the criticism of Americans using drones to attack specific targets, to attack specific individuals, ask yourself the question, would you rather use drones aimed at specific targets or would you rather send American fighter planes to do the job with the risk of these people being shot down? Are you that much in love? with pictures of coffins being unloaded at Dover Air Force Base, does the sound of taps send you swooning that much that you would prefer that Americans get killed rather than the job be done electronically? What's the difference between an artillery shell and a drone? What's the difference between a rifle bullet and a drone? What's the difference between killing a leader of ISIS or other terrorist as groups. As long as it kills. As long as it does the job. <laughs> Look, we're in a war, okay? We are not dealing with nice people. We are not dealing with brothers and cousins who were suddenly, 
my time has been cut short, yeah. or I will be cut short. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We want weapons to kill. All right. <laughs> we want weapons to kill. 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 I would like to thank the previous speaker. My attitude can be summed up as go get him, Patrick, of the Rebels. <laughs> Second, with regard to the comments that were made earlier about what's been going on in Ferguson and New York and elsewhere. Now, I wasn't personally present when Michael Brown was shot, and I don't know what happened any more than anybody else. And there have been certainly been conflicting reports about what Michael Brown did or didn't do. But there were apparently certain irregularities in the procedures that with which the district attorney in St. Louis County apparently allowed certain people to appear in front of the grand jury in a manner different than normal. That they apparently they were allowed to cross-examine witnesses was just does not usually happen in grand jury proceedings. And I cannot escape the feeling that the district attorney in St. Louis County gained the system to prove to produce the outcome that he wanted. That's number one. Number two, with regard to the situation in Staten Island, there, there is no doubt as to what happened. We've all seen the, we've all seen the video that was taken by that fellow's cell phone mm -hmm. of the police using a chokehold that was clearly illegal, clearly a violation of every rule of police procedure in New York City. And even the medical examiner in New York has ruled it a homicide. And again, I think the district attorney in Richmond County, New York, Staten Island, gained the system to produce the outcome that he wanted to protect the police. I'm glad that the federal government is looking in, into this and that in the case of what happened in Richmond, they think that they have quite possibly a valid case. So I don't think it's a matter simply of, of a black on white crime or black on black crime or that, or that so much crime is coming out of the black community. I think it's also a matter of how the police treat people. Some of you know I had an uncle who for many years was active in, in, in the civil liberties field and public interest law here in Chicago. He's gone now. And my uncle for years was active with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, which was active in getting better representation uh, for minorities who in dealing with the police. And sooner or later, I don't think the police are always wrong. I know many police officers, most of them are fine people with a very difficult job to do that they do very well. But every police department is, has bad apples. They're only, they're only human like everybody else. And too many of these bad apples have been getting away with, with murder for too long. And so to simply blame it all on the black community is absolute horseshit, plain and simple. Yeah. Uh, finally, the subject of spam came up. <laughs> the only comment I will make about is this. Now, my father, who's gone now, served during World War II and what then was the Army Air Force. One day, the subject of spam came up in his presence. And my father smiled, a very pleasant smile. And he said... My, thank you. My dad said that with regard to this product, yeah. he never wanted to see, smell, taste, or hear about spam ever again. <laughs> Period. End of story. Thank you. You know, you never leave Russia, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you could have to my dad. I appreciate it with right. every company, every crowd. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> that was good. Um, Maybe I'll do you know, Thinking of, uh, well, I, I, I did hear Bruce uh, Cummings uh, uh, speak on uh, Korea and read uh, a couple of his books. Uh, uh, and the, the uh, war between uh, North and South Korea is an interesting bit of history. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, we should go back a little further. You, you should remember that uh, though Gutenberg invented the press in uh, Europe, 
Uh, it was invented about 40 years before Gutenberg in Korea by the Koreans. Uh, and uh, the problem is that they, they didn't have any writing in the spoken language. That it was not phonetic. What they had was were Chinese ideograms. And the only people who had writing were a sort of Mandarin class of, uh, well, Koreans uh, who uh, had these Chinese ideograms that yes, generally the public couldn't read. So uh, the printing press didn't go very far in Korea. Uh, until, until the 1890s, when American and other uh, missionaries uh, discovered the the phonetic Korean language that was printed and produced Bibles and other literature and the and. Uh, Christian literature in uh, the, the uh, phonetic uh, uh, Korean. Uh, it's, uh, th that was part of the revolution. Remember that in 1905, uh, the Japanese took over Korea, and they tried to suppress the Korean language and impose Japanese. But the schools were often Christian schools who had this all this literature in Korean. Even Korean history was written in Korean. And the people learned their own language and learned uh, and the, and the, the uh, nationalist movement or movement of liberation from uh, Japanese rule uh, was uh, largely a product of Christian schools and Christian uh, educated uh, uh, Koreans. So that's one reason uh, that uh, Korea has been so open uh, to uh, Christian religious uh, uh, ways. Um, well, well that, that's a bit of history, and I've probably exceeded my time. What the college is really missing tonight is a little bit of the element of culture <laughs> that we have. And I'm going to bring a few choices from the North Korean culture. And the first thing that we're, Peter Perro had talked about was our infamous spam. And as many of you probably already know, you know, we have it here. Uh, if we can uh, just get it here. Obviously the wrong video, but it was was supposed to be the uh, spam thing. It was from a Monty Python skit, but this is probably the most well-known bit of South Korean culture we've seen in a long time.
Speaker again. I won't say anything about Korea. I, you know, I, I follow the the actions of our dear leader in the north. Seems to have a little difference of opinion from the people uh, who have spoken earlier. I just want to say I've heard of one or two things. Uh, in fiction, fiction about the minimum wage, that um, that like in in there's like a stage of work or something like this where there's a period of time in which exploitation uh, is appropriate and theft is allowed and there's. So if you go through this process, uh, you will be admitted to earning a living wage. That's about as nonsensical a thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't agree to that. <laughs> I don't agree to do it. If you want to make, if you want to hire someone to make you money for you then you are obligated to pay that individual, regardless of their age, station, qualifications, whatever, <laughs> an appropriate amount of money. You cannot keep that money and put it in your pocket and spend it on yourself. Uh, now, the other thing that's got to be corrected here, and I'm going to talk about this next week, I've actually looked into the history of the minimum wage with apparently one or two of the speakers. They, you know, actually, everybody I've heard speak about the minimum wage, I don't think knows anything about its legislative history because this talking or something here, this, this thing that somehow don't ask for an increase in wages because the consequences will be bad. What's, what could be bad about getting a higher salary? <laughs> I don't understand this. Plus, somebody seems, I, I'm sorry, boss, I asked for a raise. How could I ask for a raise? What kind of person can, am I? I'm ashamed of myself, and I apologize to everyone that I actually said that God in his head paid me more money. You crook. <laughs> now, I will tell you one thing, and I won't talk about this too much next week. There's one thing that's absolute. I'll tell you one thing that's solid fact that you can you can you can take with you on this. Going and seeking a legislative remedy or solution to salary is not the route to go, or is going to work. You saw this last week in in the city voting on this, that they were increasing the minimum wage that I should be it set at $21.72. They voted, well, they're going to increase it to $13 by 2019. Now, if I was a negotiator, I would say, all right, guys, that's not a deal. I don't accept that. Now, anyone who's a negotiator of union contracts, you take whatever the government standard is in situations like this, and I don't know. That's what I mean. Going for a legislative solution, it hasn't, it, there's even some labor historians have gone back and, and done some research on this. I've seen this that don't even bother with trying to seek legislative remedies to, to and that's what I mean. Go for it. I do lobbying. I try to influence legislation. I still do it. It's an important facet. You can't be disregarded. But in terms of us getting us getting getting us anything, One it's not going to stop straining yourself. Don't be a laughing hyena. It, it's not through. It's not going to get us what we want out of this. 
No. He's just like really, my friend. Uh, mm -hmm. There we go. But anyhow, all right, thank you very much. We'll see you next week, guys. Yeah. Oh, well, all right. right. Take your scab uh, Hormel products with you, by the way. Scab, yeah. I love spinach. I'll Union busting. I like spinach. Yeah, now let's hear it for our speaker. Yeah, and people brought up the idea of not so quality products. Uh, the spam and the Coca-Cola. Um, but likewise, the ramen is not the best dish to sit in your gut. It's a late night grab it meal. Both sides are trying to mass market something that's maybe not so nutritious, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Don't forget the Samsung phones and electronics. Well, there's a lot of quality there. And that, yep. That's one to respect. And so is a Chevy. I think uh, a Chevy truck can stand up to any Asian built truck. I, I think the Samsung phone can stand up to American built or Nokia phones. Right. Um, and and what about the large container ships that the South Korean shipyards produce? Some of the uh, largest Hyundai, in the world. Uh, Hyundai. Hyundai ships. Um, I just think in some summation, they've become more like us in copying fast foods. By they, I mean Asians. Uh, Back to a more free market yep. approach to things. Many of the countries, even Vietnam now is cozying up the U.S. Uh, please come and invest in us, uh, South Vietnam. Um, and, and a high application of technology. But we've become more like them. These quality circles that we started to build better cars. Health, I think it was an approach that helped instead of each individual putting on a bolt. And, and, um, one of the downsides is more long, uh, long work hours. Um, after all, uh, they were known for day and a half oh, hours and work days, and I think we're putting in more hours to, to the point where I've heard that American average American worker is putting in more hours now than a typical Japanese worker. And what the hell? We're riding more bikes now, aren't we? After. Centuries of Asians riding bikes to get places I'm seeing now, more bike riding. So we're trading places in good ways and in not so good ways. And that's the new global market. So thanks for coming out.